Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to this episode of the National Democratic Line Online. Uh, this afternoon, I will be hosting you. This is Professor Phoebe Zo Sanchez from the University of the Philippines, Cebu. We'll have our episode this afternoon on uh, the Marxist critique on the political economy and our uh, valued discussant for the National Democratic Line online, no other than the Chair Emeritus of the International um, League of People's Struggles. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome Professor Jose Maria Sison. Feedback. Oh. Uh, um, I po yung feedback. Hello. Hello. Okay. 
Uh, welcome to this afternoon's episode on the National Democratic Line Online. Our topic is the Marxist political economy, uh, the Marxist critique on the political economy. Um, this afternoon, I will be your host. This is Professor Phoebe Sanchez from the University of the Philippines, Cebu. Our discussant is Professor Jose Maria Sison, the chair emeritus of the International League of People's Struggles. Please help me welcome Professor Jose Maria Sison. Hello, Professor Sison. Good afternoon, Bo. Welcome. 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 Good afternoon. Welcome. Go, 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 go. Hello, Professor. Uh, Hello, Professor Sison. Welcome to the National Democratic Line online. You will have your discussion now. Uh, magandang hapon sa iyo, Phoebe, at uh, sinasamahan kita oh. sa pagbati sa lahat ng ating tagapakinig. Uh, salamat po, uh, Professor Sison. Uh, masaya ako, nandiyan ka. Now, we will discuss, we'll proceed with the Marxist critique on the political economy. We'll go straight to the first question. Um, we'll start now with the first question. So, um, please listen. What is that driving ethos? behind the Marxist critical political economy, which gives prime emphasis to the functioning of historicizing, to the function of historicizing the process of the appropriation of surplus value. Humanism is the driving ethos behind Marxist critical political economy, which gives prime emphasis on the function of historicizing the process of the appropriation of surplus value. We must understand that humanism was the rupture or break of the Renaissance from divinism that had prevailed over the medievalism and feudalism of Europe. Humanism asserted the responsibility of human beings for the social order instead of presuming that this is preordained by God. The Marxist uh, political economy uh, points out that the source of value uh, uh, is the uh, labor uh, the the labor of the the working class from the renaissance the sense of human responsibility grew with the drive for scientific knowledge rational enlightenment assertion of people's sovereignty the growth of productive forces from handicrafts through manufacturing to industrial capitalism and the recognition by classical liberal political economy of adam smith and David Ricardo, that labor is the source of new material values and creator of social wealth. In the furtherance of humanism, Marx developed further the theory of value by putting forward the theory of surplus value, which posits that the capital in the hands of the capitalist class is the main part of the total material values created by the proletariat, but appropriated by the capitalist the class on top of the wages paid to the workers. The surplus value is the unpaid labor of the workers. The Marxist political economy is a humanist critique of the alienation of surplus value, um, which uh, uh, encompasses industrial profit, bank interest, and land rent from the working class by the capitalist class and the use of capital as dead labor to further control and dehumanize living labor under conditions of wage slavery. 
Marxist political economy offers socialism as the solution to the problem of capitalist exploitation uh, through the extraction of surplus value. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Professor Season. At least it clarifies that the topic is actually basically a critique to classical political economy in mentioning David, Ricardo, and Adam Smith. The second question is, why is the concept of surplus value appropriation in the Marxist political economy always associated with labor exploitation? There is no other way for the capitalist class to accumulate capital but to buy the labor power of workers and put them to work to create new material values divisible into wages actually paid for uh, the mayor subsistence of the workers and the surplus value or unpaid labor appropriated by the capitalist employers. By itself, capital in the form of equipment, raw materials, and plant site cannot produce new uh, material values that are useful and exchangeable. Capital is congealed or dead labor and has to hire and exploit living labor in order to create new material values. Neither are new material values created in the market. It was established by studies, even during the time of Marx, that profits seemed to be gained from fluctuations of supply and demand in the market, but in fact, over long periods, the market prices hew close to production prices. It is in the process of production that new material values are created by the workers and not in the market as imagined and preached by the bourgeoisie. It is also in the place of production where the capitalist employer alienate the surplus value from the workers. In his philosophical manuscripts, Marx focused on this inhumane alienation of the uh, surplus value by dead labor from living labor, and he proposes as the humane solution, socialism. Okay, and the next question, Professor. How is the process of appropriation of surplus value, which is so transparent in pre-bourgeois societies, effected in a bourgeois society where there is formal equality and voluntary exchange among free commodity owners and equivalent exchange under free competition? In bourgeois law and society, there is a ruling class presumption that an illusion that there is equality and voluntary exchange of values under free competition. The capitalist is supposed to pay wages or provide the means of subsistence to the workers and he extracts a surplus value on his behalf as industrial entrepreneur, his bank and the owner of the land. But inequality arises from the capitalist private ownership of the means of production. In the process of production, the capitalist does not contribute to the production of new material values. He even hires managers to oversee the work of the workers. In this regard, it is useful to understand how private property in the means of production in the hands of the exploiting classes has arisen from the late barbaric stage of primitive communal society <coughs> when settled agriculture, use of work animals, and metal tools and patriarchy arose and then developed further at a relatively more rapid rate upon the increased use of metallurgy, class exploitation, and literacy in civilization through the social systems of slavery, feudalism, and capitalism. Marxist anthropology initiated by Engels in the origin of family, private property, and the state on the basis of the anthropology of his time provides an excellent background to the advance of humanism to Marxist class analysis and class struggle uh, on historical and historical materialism. Okay. And then the basic question that we should, that should follow logically, why does Marx see the need to historicize classical political economy by uh, going beyond the realm of commodity circulation to the particularities of commodity production? Marx saw the necessity of historicizing political economy and assert the primacy of commodity production over commodity circulation 
in order both to understand the production of new material values and to propose the socialist solution uh, to the problem of capitalist exploitation or the alienation of the surplus value from its uh, own uh, real creators. Uh, uh, Marx uh, traces um, uh, the, 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 the making of the commodity and the loss of, uh, and uh, uh, lays bare the loss of motion involved in the production of that commodity uh, through the exercise of labor power. Without historicizing by the Marxist critique, all kinds of illusions can be generated by the bourgeoisie to befuddle the people and conceal class exploitation through abstractions, especially those espoused under liberalism. The political economists Adam Smith and David Ricardo put forward the labor theory of value but did not go far enough. It was Marx who put forward the theory of a surplus value. And bourgeois liberals overlooked the reality of class exploitation and class struggle to harp on e equal political rights in the abstract and overlooked the gross economic and uh, social uh, inequality due to the private ownership of the means of production and class uh, exploitation in reality. And here comes this late in history. Eh? Uh, Neoliberalism uh, is actually anti-liberalism. Uh, it denies, it denies uh, uh, labor power as a, as a source of new material values. It uh, credits uh, uh, capital in the hands of the uh, bourgeoisie uh, as the uh, creator of wealth and the creator of jobs and um, uh, make the and, and try to uh, turn uh, the working class into a passive entity uh, in 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 concept. So that's precisely why um, labor power is given more emphasis if historicizing. Uh, the production process is being scrutinized. And the basic question now, why does Marx's critical political economy look at both process of commodity production and commodity circulation as social processes directed by markets being social organizations rather than looking at markets as institutions driven by the powers of the owners of money? Marxist political economy looks at both processes of commodity production and commodity circulation as social processes in order to expose the capitalist as exploiting class and the workers as exploited class and the irreconcilable contradictions and um, uh, class struggle between the two. He peers through the veil of money, which is uh, which obscured the classes and um, class struggle from the process of production to the economic and political struggle. Um, in the, uh, economic terms, uh, Das Kapital actually covers uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the production of uh, the commodity uh, to um, um, uh, how uh, the, the capitalist financial system works. Uh, and uh, uh, so that means Das Kapital from volume one to volume three. Uh, Marx took care in Das Kapital to explain the role played by money, credit, and the banks in serving the interest um, of the capitalist class. In fact, Marx and Engels always made clear that surplus value extracted by the capitalist covers not only his profit, but also the interest of the banks and rent for the landowner. And Lenin later noted the merger of industrial and finance capital as one of the major characteristics of monopoly capitalism. Finance monopoly capitalism has distinctly further become superior to the purely or mainly industrial monopoly uh, uh, capitalism in terms of super profit making in the era of modern imperialism. Oh, thank you so much, Professor. I, I learned from this discussion now that uh, if we have to define the market, it should be defined as a social relations, a, a result of a social relations. But if you go to business management classes, you don't define the market as social relations of production or relations of 
the owners of money and the laborers. Okay, we go to the next question. The next question is, it appears that Marx's political economy is saying, society needs capital, that's practically land and labor, but it doesn't need to have, or it need not have capitalists. Why and how? As I have earlier pointed out, we can dispense with the capitalists, their private ownership of the means of production, and their extraction of surplus value, but we cannot dispense with the workers in creating new material values for society. The workers are capable of managing themselves by having their own committees of management comprising of representatives of the revolutionary proletarian party, the workers and technical experts. If the capitalist ownership of the means of production is done away uh, with upon the success of the revolutionary movement, the working class can use the social profit to expand production, raise wages, increase social services, and manage reasonable expenses for administration and defense of the entire society. A large amount is saved from dispensing with the capitalists and bourgeois managers. Okay, thank you, Professor. Now, Marx's critical political economy appears to say that private property is a form of theft, as it is a function of the appropriation of surplus labor value and is therefore contrary to the principles of fair share. But why? How can society survive without private properties? What mechanisms shall the perceived Marxist societies adapt as an offshoot to private property ownership? It is a given fact in the history of mankind that the institution of private property in the means of production for millennia, thousands of years, has been a decisive factor in organizing and realizing the relatively big leaps of social and economic development from the tens of thousands of years of primitive communal society to the thousands of years of slavery and feudalism and further to the hundreds of years of capitalism since uh, the 13th century. The Communist Manifesto described very well uh, how, with the, uh, how under capitalism so much has been built so easily in, in, in a rapid way compared to uh, previous uh, uh, social forms of society. Uh, but we have come, uh, uh, and it points out, uh, that we have come to the point in history as pointed out by the Communist Manifesto, that an exploited class like the industrial proletariat has arisen as the most productive and progressive force in society and is capable of emancipating itself and other exploited classes and building the socialist society. For the first time in the history of mankind, the, the exploited class can uh, do away with the exploiting class. The time has come for the proletariat to establish socialist society, make further social advances, and pave the way to rendering unnecessary the domination of one class by another and build a classless communist society. Okay, that's quite utopian. Uh, Professor, what do you perceive should be the correct model of a Marxist or a public-led economy? Are there exemplars for this type of economy existing now? What what is its possibility in the future? In his critique of the Gotha program, Marx made clear that in a socialist society in which the capitalist proprietors of the means of production no longer operate, the working class can allocate the economic gains that it creates to, to the expansion of production, improvement of wages, expansion of social services, promotion of uh, uh, socialist culture, efficient uh, administration, and adequate defense. We have seen in history the great examples of socialist revolution and construction in the Soviet Union and China. But alas, these were undermined by modern, by modern revisionism and totally superseded by capitalist restoration. But there are still societies like the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, Cuba and the Socialist Republic of Vietnam, which regard themselves as socialist by acclaiming the class leadership of the proletariat and referring to uh, uh, 
certain measures of public ownership uh, of the strategic and basic industries, the use of centralized economic planning, and the deliberate improvement of wages and expansion of social services. The socialist cause has suffered major setbacks since the capitalist restoration of capitalism in the former socialist countries and the Soviet bloc and in China. But there are several related factors that keep on generating the class struggle within the proletariat and the capitalist class in capitalist countries, the struggle against imperialism by the oppressed peoples and nations, and struggles among the imperialist powers. Uh, there is also ongoing class struggle within China and Russia. The social character of production has accelerated so fast since the end of World War II because of the rise of productivity through collective labor and higher technology, but the private character of appropriating the new material values created by the workers has become extremely unjust, especially under the neoliberal policy regime in the last 40 years. The crisis of overproduction has become more frequent and more severe. Thus, the anti-imperialist and class struggles have escalated in both developed and underdeveloped countries. The imperialist powers try to shift the burden of crisis to the underdeveloped countries through neo-colonial and neoliberal methods of economic exploitation, state terrorism, and wars of aggression. But the oppressed peoples and nations are fighting back for national and social liberation. The addition of China and Russia to the ranks of the imperialist powers has sharpened inter-imperialist contradictions. Since the financial meltdown of 2008, the crisis of the world capitalist system has, has, uh, uh, has become worse. Um, neoliberalism has practically uh, exposed its bankruptcy uh, in the course of uh, uh, this uh, severe, uh, this uh, frequent recurrence of uh, severe crisis of overproduction. What has been euphemistically called the Great Recession is becoming the Great Depression, worse than its antecedent in the 1930s. The main partners under the neoliberal policy of imperialist globalization, the US and China, had become the chief economic competitors and chief political rivals. But the, goods, but the good news is that anti-imperialist and democratic mass struggles are spreading and intensifying on a world scale and are presaging the resurgence of the world proletarian revolution. Oh, thank you so much, Professor. That's uh, quite very sumptuous for this part. Now let's have a short break and then we'll proceed to questions from the uh, audience after this short break. Sila paalis na ako, naunahan pa yung araw Almusal ko yung baho, agawan ng jeep at trabaho At traffic pa sa may kalaw, halos hindi na ako buhi Puro na lang ako talaw sa tahanang maliit Kada buwan, limang libo, inuuwi ko Sakit, balikat, likot at ulo, malaki na raw Ba't pa ako nagre-reklamo, talagang tiis trabaho Talagang linis ang baho ng boss na Amerikano Kutakwal at ilagong katawan Dilugit ay lahat mula balat ang nalaman Hanap naman ng bago pagtapos ng ilang buwan Ginagawa lahat magdalaman lang ang dyan Magkano nga ba ang salapi? Magtrabaho nga ba ako magpaapi? Ang dalapi ang gagami Mabuhay ang maayos hanggang sa mga kalaos Wala ang maga hanggang gabi Magkano nga ba ang salapi? Magkano nga ba ako Natutong makipag 
pag-usapan na rin kahit parang ito na yung kapalaran na kaya kong abutin kay rapan ng sakit na di ko kaya gamutin kahit ano pang gawin kahit lang hanggang hindi lang kanin ang pagkapain kasalanan ko raw kasi hindi nakatapos at kayo kalabaw nakakapamintig sa pagod naluluno pero sumusukong pa rin sa agos parang kailangang sumigaw para lang di mapaos Matay kong bukura Mahinga ay hindi sapat Kaya pang magpangka Nandang po yung ira Matay kong bukura Mahinga ay hindi sapat Kaya pang magpangka Nandang po yung ira Biglang nagkasakit, lumiban pa saglit Di magkamayaw ilang araw, di kumagaling Naipon ang gawain, amoy kalit na sakin Si sakin abot kung hindi kayanin pang hapulin Sa alaala ka na lang nagkakasama Sa presensya mo'y namuhuli lang Para saan pa ba ang pera Kung buhay pala natin ang nakatea Kung inuubos, sinabos, sinabos, bumalik na at bumagal ang mundo Na tutuwa lumakit ang tubo Sinugal ko na lahat na natidesperado Umaapaw ng ibabaw, wakailangan Ang mga nakatira sa mitahanan Tulog na nang hihilat sa pinagtaanan Kung inalas ko pa may kasalanan Kasalanan, kapit sa mga mayari at paglarian At pinatulan kahit ito na kumain Ito ko na pa rin para lang merong makihain Kano nga ba ang salapi? Magtrabaho nga ba o mapapi? Dapat itama ang mga mali Buhay ko ba'y katumbas ng salapi? Baboy sa kural, nasa kami na sila Nag-aabang sa utos na Inote na ang mga hinding hindi magagabi Manggagawang tulad ko, hindi hiram mo lang Ang tapang sa sandatang dalay Buhayang malaki ang tiyan, ulo ay walang laman Laho ang takutakuhan ng naghari-harihan Masama bang ipaglaban, aking karapatan Kung husti siya'y para lamang sa mga mayaman Raps pa na ayas, huwag ko malamay Pag riok lako, tulog sa bahay Di lang tanim ang ka, di lang bahay Kaya mo rin baskusin, masiki ang lamay Walang kalang welta sa kundun, dyan sila si nanay Balik na ang dropang hina, takpalabas sa mga hanan May mas baskit ang taas, porma ng pagpatay Tapos no sweat lang magkadugo sa kamay Sakot sa tot sa kahirapan Mga pulis dutong buwang sa lansangan Pumapatay ng mga manggagawang makabayan tinakdang Protector ng kahamang mayayaman Pagkataon nyo ay talagang nakakadiri 
Tuta at alipin ang nagkaharing uwi Isa tatlo at isa dalawa Ulis mabuti lang pag siya'y patay na Malalim na yan Pulog na natin to Gege One Okay, welcome back again to our National Democratic Line Online, the Andy Line Online episode on the Marxist critique on the political economy with our discussant, Professor Jose Maria Sison, Chair Emeritus of the International League of People's Struggles. Now we will proceed to the second half of our uh, program, which is entertaining questions from the audience as posted in our Anakbayan Europa Facebook page. And um, some were actually sent uh, personally or texted to the tech. Now, the first question here for Professor Sison. What is your summary in the revisionist political economy of post-1956 Soviet Union and post-1976 China? Are the laws of motion that operate basically the same as what Marx critiqued on capitalism more than a century and a half ago, or there is a stark difference? Well, uh, uh, the quickest summary I can make of the way the modern revisionism restored uh, capitalism is to uh, uh, re restate uh, the uh, proposition that uh, uh, capitalism is theft and um, and um, uh, uh, the restoration of capitalism would involve uh, essentially 
um, uh, the revival of the uh, exploitative methods of taking the surplus value from the working class. Now, let me be more uh, concrete in very con historical terms. Um, so let us consider Khrushchev uh, from 1956 to uh, the time that he was overthrown uh, in 19, sometime in 1964. Well, he had big words uh, to justify reforms that he was going to make. Uh, he said that this would serve to strengthen the material and cultural foundation of uh, communism. But in fact, those reforms um, meant, to, um, meant to fragmentize uh, the socialist economy. So uh, the economic ministries were decentralized and then um, the rule yeah, was um, adopted that uh, the collectives and, um, and the factories would work as uh, autonomous units. Uh, so egotism in the communes as well as in the factories uh, was promoted. The, uh, these communes and, um, and um, the factories would be responsible for their cost and benefit uh, cost and profit uh, accounting. And then um, uh, in the case of the communes, uh, uh, they were uh, separated. They, they were supposed to have, to have been given freedom to deal with the machine and tractor stations. You know? So, you know, the machine and tractor stations operated by the working class on, and by the social state uh, uh, were the command post of socialism in agriculture. But uh, the, uh, Khrushchev uh, separated the commune, the collectives from uh, the uh, machine and tractor uh, uh, stations. And each side uh, was uh, required to operate uh, uh, according to uh, their autonomous cost and profit uh, accounting. But the worst part of it, the managers, the managers given the we can, we were given higher and fire power. So um, the, the managers uh, would uh, uh, perform the role of the bourgeoisie in the controlling the factors of production. And um, so um, uh, in agriculture, you know, uh, peop, uh, the, the news, uh, the reforms were praised for being able to deliver vegetables on time and so on and so forth. But eventually, uh, the uh, old, uh, old phenomenon of kulaks, rich peasants, arising uh, 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 came about, and um, this, uh, and when uh, you know uh, the collectives uh, had this uh, fragmentized mentality, uh, the uh, uh, the uh, uh, peasants or the farm workers concentrated more on their private plots. By the way, private plots were enlarged, no? The private plots were enlarged at the and uh, they were paid attention to by the farmers at the expense of the collectives. So, you know, uh, every unit was, uh, uh, was up to making profits without minding the entire uh, uh, agriculture and the entire economy. Oh, what about the factories? So the higher and firepower of the managers were used to uh, uh, was used to uh, uh, put the workers under the control. Whereas you know, in comparison to the time of Stalin, there were the uh, workers' inspection uh, commissions, which um, um, which controlled uh, uh, the managers. Now this time it is the workers being controlled by the managers, so there is some kind of a revenge by the bourgeois type managers on, on the workers. And um, uh, at the same time, private enterprise uh, was allowed. Let's uh, take an easy example. So, you know, uh, there, is a, uh, a, uh, there is a government uh, uh, 
service agency, let's say plumbing, um, what the uh, what the managers did was to tell the, um, the the workers to foul up, mess up their uh, their work in plumbing, so that the uh, those who need plumbing would rather go to the private entrepreneurs, to the pri to the private uh, shops, than uh, uh, and then then approach uh, the state uh, pl uh, plumbing agency. So that's how. Uh, the worst part would be the practice of stealing stealing products from uh, uh, warehouses already started during the time of Khrushchev. Uh, this became bigger during the time of Brezhnev. So factory uh, products would be uh, classified as, uh, um, as defective and um, uh, but then uh, these are in, uh, these are products in good condition. But these products uh, uh, classified as defective would be taken uh, by the private entrepreneurs and sold to um, um, sold in the free market. The free markets increased, and um, uh, during the time of uh, Brezhnev, uh, uh, these entrepreneurs uh, stealing products from the state warehouses would become bigger. They would become the mafia, the big syndicates. Now, um, in the time of Khrush, in the time of Brezhnev, uh, what is that sound? But in the time of Brezhnev, uh, um, it was decided because, of the, because the Soviet Union uh, would take a social imperialist turn uh, from revisionism, uh, the, this great nation ambition of uh, great Russian uh, uh, nationalism would assert itself, and there was the Cold War with the U.S. So Brezhnev uh, uh, wanted to reconcentrate, to recentralize uh, those ministries that were decentralized by Khrushchev uh, to uh, make sure that the Soviet state had enough funds and could dispose of the resources for the arms race. Uh, so, uh, you know, the anomalies, the criminal anomalies, the anomalies and the criminality uh, rose. Uh, so, uh, you have uh, actually criminal syndicates um, uh, that are the product of connivance between the, the bureaucrats and the uh, uh, so-called entrepreneurs or, or criminal entrepreneurs. And... Um, they grew so big, but the, that by the time of uh, uh, Gorbachev, uh, they were the, the ones in a position to um, they were in a position to buy all the certificates of shares in, in the, the so many um, uh, Soviet uh, uh, state enterprises, and uh, and also uh, well, you know, you have this. Uh, amount of decentralization and privatization going on and the growth of uh, private enterprise in the, inter in the interstices, uh, you have at the same time, you have the uh, um, overarching uh, manipulation of economic policy and practice by the, the bureaucrats. They are usually in connivance uh, with their own relatives and friends. Uh, in taking advantage of the state sector. The state sector of the economy is maintained because it's the it's from which resources are, uh, uh, are from which resources are drawn uh, to be in which assets uh, um, come uh, for privatization because you know in a socialist state uh, uh, you have uh, you have private uh, ownership of the means of production already you know, uh, done away with, uh, but uh, in the comeback of private uh, ownership of the means of production, uh, you have to utilize the state uh, not only as a source of assets, but it is a way of getting more finances uh, to uh, be able to uh, increase uh, private assets. So that, that was done in the in the Soviet Union. In China, maybe <laughs> I hope I can be more brief about China. Uh, I will uh, refer you to the, the biggest uh, struggle uh, in the uh, handling of the bourgeoisie. Uh, 
uh, mm. the big bourgeoisie. Uh, you know, there were even the big compradors who uh, had um, a tolerable record vis-a-vis -vis the revolutionary movement and were allowed to, you know, become national bourgeois um, by, uh, uh, insofar as they support the state policy of socialism. So anyway, um, uh, for a long while, the, the enterprises of the big bourgeoisie had some big leeway, especially from 1949 to 1952. Uh, you see, uh, the, the country had to be stabilized. Uh, there was so much uh, destruction as a result of the civil war. Uh, and further on back, uh, uh, you know, the war against Japan. And so uh, there, there was that period of... Uh, uh, re rehabilitation and reconstruction, and then there was the Korean War. So um, um, only eh, only those classified as bureaucrat capitalists uh, um, would have their assets uh, uh, confiscated. But the big bourgeoisie have no record of hostility to the to the revolutionary movement uh, were allowed uh, to operate. Uh, then in 52, there was a determination to make a basic socialization of the economy that was done from 1952 to 1956 or 57. Uh, by the time, by the year 1956 and 1957, there was a debate uh, mm. what to do with the big bourgeoisie uh, and its assets. So it was decided that they can be, they can continue to be in the state, um, um, uh, in the state uh, private corporations, combination of the state and private corporations. Uh, you know, this is, uh, this was adopted in order to absorb private capital instead of, you know, forcing them to, you know, fly away and uh, the capitalists to fly away. Uh, so long as they were patriotic enough, they can stay on. And, and then the, um, it was decided in the 52 uh, that uh, the uh, capitalists uh, would continue to receive dividends. And dividends were as high as 25% uh, from the net uh, income of uh, private, state private corporations in 1956 um, um, and 57. So Mao proposed, well, uh, they've had their time getting dividends and then the dividends are too big. Uh, let's consider their capital as uh, money put in the bank. They receive a smaller percentage in terms of uh, uh, in, back in interest on their assets, no longer dividends as high as 25%. Uh, uh, so, uh, you know, those, the rightist and the, the revisionist already influenced by the Soviet Union and by their own bourgeois background in China, um, uh, opposed the position of Mao. So Mao faced an opposition even in, just in his proposal to, um, to reduce the uh, capitalist to receiving only uh, interest rather than dividend. No? And then when it, comes, it came to agriculture, uh, uh, capitalist roaders, like Liu Xiaoqi and Deng Xiaoping, even Zhou Enlai, together with Chen Yun, uh, they, they were opposed to, the, um, to raising the, co the agricultural cooperatives to the level of the commune. They wanted to prolong the concessions to the rich peasants. Um, so uh, uh, that was the case. So that would be uh, so late. Uh, I mean to say uh, that this... Uh, in, in a short while, in historic time. So uh, the Great Leap Forward, anyway, was pushed through. And it was successful. It was successful against imperialism uh, blockade, uh, the Soviet abandonment of major contracts against the natural calamities, and so on. And, um, but uh, while difficulties were being uh, faced in, during the Cultural Revolution, there were the counter-revolutionaries making attacks on the party and Mao Zedong. So when uh, the, uh, uh, the Great Leap Forward was definitely successful 
and even yielded uh, bumper crops and agriculture. Uh, so Mao launched the socialist education movement from 1963 to 1966. Um, but this would be sabotage, no? The attacks continued on Mao. Uh, the, the Chinese revisionists uh, and capitalist orders kept on harping, oh, we must make the uh, market more lively so that the economy will expand. Let us now enjoy the initial prosperity eh, in, the socialist, in, the, in the socialist economy. Uh, but then they were actually advocating uh, the continuance of the privileges of the bourgeoisie. So the Cultural Revolution had to be waged. And it looked like the Cultural Revolution for a while uh, would be successful. I think there was great success during the first five years. But in the next five years, there would be undermining. Uh, intrigues were let loose, as in, as in the Soviet Union, intrigues were let loose against the, uh, uh, um, against the left, no? all sorts of, and the left uh, fractured. No? So the uh, rightist centrist combination would prevail uh, against the, the line of class struggle by harping on the need to have diplomatic and trade relations with the U.S., uh, in order to face up to Soviet social imperialism and um, uh, make modernization, uh, make reforms in that regard and integrate with the world capitalist system. So that would be, um, uh, that would be how the uh, capitalist rulers uh, uh, were, were um, uh, maintaining and promoting their position and uh, uh, Deng Xiaoping was uh, rehabilitated, uh, was uh, legally rehabilitated. He could have been retired permanently, but he was uh, rehabilitated. And um, this was a manifestation of the success of the rightist and centrist combination against the left. Huh? So, you know, by, uh, you know, by 1976, uh, after the death of Mao, uh, the counter-revolutionary coup occurred with all supporters of the GPCR being removed out, being removed from the Communist Party and the state, and uh, uh, the capitalist rulers taking over, and uh, the communes were dismantled, uh, rural industries were uh, privatized. Uh, the same things that uh, uh, Khrushchev did in China, in in the, in, uh, in the Soviet Union, uh, uh, were done like you know uh, cost and profit accounted um, accounting by um, by 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 particular uh, unions higher and fire power given to the managers and so on and so forth huh? so uh, and uh, basically you see uh, the the state uh, sector of the economy is maintained as a milking cow as a milking cow and um, they are also turned into uh, what you call uh, uh, what you call the uh, uh, firms that uh, 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 when they produce something, you make the firm may you may because it's supposed to be state controlled. It is inefficient, so uh, there is deliberate uh, uh, there is deliberate deterioration of the quality of uh, management and production. So, in order to justify further the privatization of the economy. So, that was uh, done uh, for, uh, uh, especially from 1978 onwards. And then the Soviet, the U.S. was careful. Well, up to, nine, up to the Tiananmen, so-called Tiananmen uprising, that was yeah. actually an uprising not only in Beijing, but in uh, so many cities in China. It's basically an uprising against the inflation and corruption. But uh, uh, China would tell the U.S., uh, you have your sweatshop, uh, you're giving us concessions with regard to sweatshop operations to bring you cheap shoes, eh? cheap shoes and clothing. Not enough, no? So uh, they asked for more concessions from the, from the U.S., uh, so that China would gain access to the market. We can, we can um, buy things from you only if you allow us to produce things that we can sell to you. So that was the Chinese logic. And so, uh, and then, 
but the, the US are clev the is clever. Oh, let the, you liberalize further your uh, investment laws and so on. Uh, you join WTO and comply with the terms and so on. So, so much, so many more concessions were given to China and uh, China took advantage of these concessions. The mm -hmm. concessions that would uh, raise the growth rates of China, the rate of exploitation in common, uh, 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 put into effect by both uh, 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 the collaboration by the collaboration of both the Chinese and the American big bourgeoisie. So by that time, there was already a big bourgeoisie in China, owning um, uh, large firms. Uh, um, so in the last three decades in China, uh, you see big corporations. Uh, real estate, technology, marketing, manufacturing, and so on. Um, they would be they, they, they uh, could be the pride of any um, of any uh, architect of uh, of uh, capitalist uh, building. So that was the case. Um, um, okay, okay. In China today, there is the persistence of uh, a state monopoly capitalism in mm -hmm. connivance with private monopoly capitalism because, uh, uh, you know, each side contributes to the development of capitalism, but the growth of private monopoly capitalism is already such that uh, um, uh, it is uh, um, bigger and uh, grows larger at a faster rate. Uh, the um, private monopoly capitalism in China is not possible without stealing, eh? without stealing from the side of, of state monopoly capitalism. And uh, uh, the same family members are on both sides of this two-tiered economy. For instance, Xi Jinping denies having 1.5 billion assets, no? as uh, pointed out by uh, uh, a, a researcher. But he cannot deny that his sister, uh, Chi Chao Chao, uh, owns 1.7 uh, billion billion uh, uh, dollars worth of assets, especially in the Wang industries and other enterprises. So the Central Committee of uh, China includes millionaires and billionaires. The National People's Congress uh, openly has. Um, um, uh, or the, let's start with the Communist Party. The Communist Party uh, the boast of Jack Ma as a member. Millionaires and billionaires and billionaires are members of the Communist Party. Eh? Eh? Quite uh, uh, exceptional, no? <laughs> and then in the National Congress has 100 billionaires. That beats the U.S. Congress. Not a single billionaire is... Is in the U, uh, is in the U.S. Congress as of uh, the year 2016. Huh? Uh, there was only one capitalist with 440 million dollars as assets in the lower house. No? And uh, 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 you, you have now, uh, well, uh, most uh, that there is a bigger number of billionaires in China than uh, even if it is the number two uh, capitalist economy than in the number one economy of the U.S. So I hope that uh, suggest, uh, that, uh, uh, that uh, answers the question fully about uh, Marx's uh, critique being uh, uh, further validated or not by, uh, by, by capitalism uh, in, in the present era. So uh, it's still basically, you know, the exploitation of the working class. For um, any de for the development of capital, for the development of capitalism, uh, uh, the basic law of exploiting the working class continues. Uh, capital cannot be drawn from capital. Um, you have to draw capital to survive. Must keep on drawing fresh blood from living labor. So uh, the law of surplus value. Uh, op continues to operate in the growth of capitalism. Okay. okay. Uh, the, base, uh, the, question, the question. The question is uh, a comparative analysis on Soviet Union revisionism and China's revisionism. 
but let us pay attention to the answer of Professor Jose Maria Sison, the emphasis on the capitalist rotors, the emphasis on those who manage and who has the power to fire and hire. And um, the existing, uh, you know, practice of privatization, deregulation and market liberalization is still, is also being uh, played up by Russia and China. Now we go to the second question, Professor Sison. Under globalization, trading of products seems to be now codependent with each other, such as uh, similar to assembly lines scattered around the world where cheap raw materials and labor may seem to be available. What will happen to these countries when imperialism is overthrown by socialism? Would countries on a backward state of revolution benefit to it from it? or would bring them to a much more worse economic state? Well, while the US and China became the main partners in promoting and uh, applying neoliberalism all over the world, uh, especially from uh, the 1990s uh, uh, to sometime in 2012 or so, uh, it looks like um, uh, the global supply chain would keep on uh, developing, uh, centralized mainly uh, at uh, uh, at the rung at the layer of the of uh, China. Uh, China became the principal uh, platform, the main platform for putting together all those. Uh, uh, Maquilladora products, those reassembled things, reprocess, those uh, processed things from different parts of uh, uh, Asia. Yeah? Uh, it, let us focus on, on, uh, on uh, 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 our part of the world, East Asia or Southeast Asia. You know, uh, there was a time in the 70s where, you know, uh, every so many countries. Uh, uh, you, the, the, the different countries concentrated on their export processing zones and engaged in French processing with uh, inputs uh, coming from abroad. No? Then, uh, but the, the Philippines uh, would not do as well as, you know, the other um, uh, Southeast Asian countries and definitely would not do as well as uh, Taiwan or, or and South uh, Korea. Uh, but anyway, in all phases of development of U.S. policy, economic policy covering the Philippines, the Philippines was, has always been a victim of its being a source of, uh, being a rich source of uh, raw materials. So the U.S. and its other allies uh, and other subordinates in, the, in, in, the, in East Asia would always enjoy eh? exploiting, taking advantage of the rich resources of the Philippines. Watch, huh? uh, Japan huh? uh, took advantage of the mineral ores and the lugs from the Philippines. Then when the time for the so-called newly industrializing economies came, the Philippines was not developed. And then came China. <laughs> uh, uh, the China, uh, uh, when the 1997 Asian financial crisis came, uh, that was that that uh, meant the collapse of uh, yeah. those uh, 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 the collapse of those uh, well Japan uh, was the one that stagnated first of all no uh, because of its own abuse of uh, credit and and uh, and um, inflated assets no? and then uh, by 1997 uh, you have the so-called newly industrializing countries uh, having their happy days but then 1997 came and and there was a there was a collapse yeah, of uh, this uh, uh, of this uh, economy supplying goods directly to the US market China would become the center yeah? uh, amidst the 1997 crisis China would rise as uh, the main platform uh, in the in the uh, so-called global supply chain, especially on the side of uh, Asia. So uh, now that there is a decoupling 
of the two big romantics, U.S. and China. Yeah, there is now, um, since uh, uh, this relationship has been unstable since uh, uh, Obama, when since the U.S. realized that China was becoming a political uh, rival and economic competitor, uh, the, there is now the fear that uh, of uh, uh, pro-imperialist uh, economies, bullshit economies, that there will be a balkanization, balkanization of the so global supply chain. So China will no longer be uh, the main platform uh, um, because the U.S. wants to cut down, uh, to cut down the export surplus of China because China has been playing, has been using this surplus in order to export capital and uh, have its own, uh, have its own uh, imperialist ventures. And so the policy of the U.S. now, together with its uh, um, traditional imperialist allies, to move production, to move their manufacturing operations from China to India, Bangladesh, uh, Vietnam, and um, Thailand. So there is now what is called uh, a balkanization of, uh, of the global supply chain. So um, that is uh, the U.S. and other uh, imp traditional imperialist powers are still to use cheap labor uh, in, in areas where the labor is cheaper. And that's the law of capitalist exploitation, where you can extract the most uh, surplus value, that's where you go. And... Um, so uh, uh, that is the trend. Uh, we'll have to watch out how much China will be uh, cut down and undermined by the by the moves of the U.S. Um, it will take me a long time to discuss other aspects of this uh, contradic growing contradictions or conflict between China and the U.S. But uh, um, relevant to the question, I, I will say that there is a balkanization of the global supply chain already occurring. And uh, uh, this involves, uh, you know, uh, growing lack of understanding and economic, uh, not only economic competition, but conflict, economic conflicts, uh, moving on to political conflicts. So inter-imperialist contradictions are sharpening. And, um, uh, well, uh, let us see how well the imperialist powers can uh, can 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 slow down on their uh, inter-imperialist contradictions by shifting the burden of crisis uh, to, to the poor people, the 84% eh, of the human population in the world. No? The global South contains still contains 84% eh, yeah. of uh, humankind. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, uh, let's proceed let's to the, the third, third question. question. Under a socialist political economy, who would invest in businesses? Will there still be a room for competition? That's question four. When there are methods of keeping up the spirit of uh, competition, not necessarily within your own borders, among capitalists or between capitalists and the socialist sector, uh, but, you know, uh, the, the, your socialist country and socialist economy in relation to capitalist countries. Um, well, definitely within a socialist economy, uh, for that economy to be socialist, it would have to, um, it would uh, have to take the, um, uh, the state and public sector uh, 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 in charge of the economy. The best uh, way is to keep out uh, uh, a private enterprise because any any concession that is out of time or that has become passé uh, under circumstances that are already passé, you uh, you try to maintain private enterprise, it will destroy, it will undermine uh, socialism. Uh, you know, concessions to private entrepreneurs are made only during. Uh, periods like those of the new economic policy and during the period of rehabilitation and reconstruction in China. But after that, if you continue to give concessions to, uh, to capitalists, the capitalists will, uh, will kill socialism, as they have already done. 
uh, in countries where the revisionists uh, have their way. So, uh, what you do among your own uh, among your own uh, workers and uh, uh, managers, there can be a competition. There can be a petition, competition between those who can propose more effective means of uh, of um, production, more effective uh, ways of managing uh, the work and improving on the equipment. Yeah? Um, uh, many uh, technical innovations have arisen, actually, in the, even in the history of capitalism. Uh, capital uh, in, um, technological innovations occur because they are proposed by the by the let's say the weavers who make clothes, by the workers who man the machines, um, and then uh, those uh, children, those who should be predominantly the children of workers and peasants who take who get their education in science and technology should be able to pay back what they owe eh, to the social state, and they will make. Um, proposals for innovation so uh, you know uh, it's not you know in a socialist country it, it does not uh, things are not decided by having a, business, a, a a master's degree or doctor's degree in business management from uh, from Harvard uh, it is more important to have scientists engineers and other technologists um, uh, produced by your uh, socialist educational system, they will be the source of new ideas. Uh, science and uh, and labor would combine to make the big advances. And then, of course, you can you can have a sense of competition uh, between the entire socialist state and the capitalist states. Uh, you can keep on comparing uh, your uh, level of development. Of course, uh, the capitalist countries have the advantage of uh, centuries of uh, colonialism and neocolonialism. Eh? But uh, you have rapid ways through centralized economic planning, through the rapid production of scientists and engineers, you have rapid ways through collective labor, eh? better organizations of, uh, of labor. You have the effective means of... Um, of uh, uh, advancing fast. These are advantages that do not belong. Um, and now, I, I let me put forward a joke, which has some uh, serious implications. Uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, um, uh, some people who are not necessarily revisionists in, cap in, uh, in uh, socialist countries will make a joke. Well, as far as we are concerned, uh, Socialism is a shortcut, eh? it's the shortcut to capitalism. Uh, mm -hmm. It took some centuries, thousands of years in fact, for a background, and hundreds of years since the 13th century for industrial capitalism to arise. Okay? And um, you have the primitive uh, uh, ways of accumulating capital, colonialism, dispossession of the peasants to proletarianize them and to bring them for as uh, for beggars of jobs, you know. So um, those things were done by capitalism. But in the case, so it took hundreds of years. But socialism uh, develops only, it develops industry in, on, in only uh, a few years. In the case of the Soviet Union, 19, let us say, 1927, uh, uh, after the new economic policy. 1956. That's only how many years? Huh? A few decades. Seven. Three decades. <laughs> and in the case of China, from 1976 uh, to uh, to the present, or uh, you have already, uh, you have only a few decades. So uh, really, the joke is uh, <laughs> rings through that with the with the modern revision is taking over. Uh, it takes only a few decades for a socialist country to become um, to become capitalist. But thanks to Mao's theory and practice of the uh, uh, cultural revolution under proletarian dictatorship or the GPCR, uh, the problem is uh, clearly posed 
and the solutions uh, in principle and methods uh, are presented. So uh, that's the uh, that's the hope. Eh? That's the okay. basis of the hope that uh, socialism will still prevail. But I think the material basis of the hope that the world proletarian revolution will resurge. Mm. It is because of the imperialism, because it's because of imperialism itself, um, and uh, the continuous uh, continuous development of the social character of production. You know, collective labor is becoming more efficient. It goes on along with the adoption of higher technology, and this hastens the crisis of overproduction. And so you now have intensified contradictions among the imperialist powers. And within China and uh, the Soviet Union uh, and, the, and, and Russia, you can bet there are revolutionary forces of the proletariat now developing because they have seen better times. And then uh, also in the, tra in the traditional uh, imperialist countries, um, the, uh, uh, the, the, the truth of reality will ring louder than all the... Uh, uh, all the propaganda and theorizing uh, by the pro by the bourgeoisie uh, uh, up to um, up to all sorts of uh, subjectivist philosophies like postmodernism, post-structuralism, post this, post that. The contradictions of uh, uh, bourgeois society. Uh, are uh, now sharpening and uh, so there are these the same conditions that would bring about the possibility of socialist revolution are now developing fast uh, the rising social character of production and the ridiculously um, extreme uh, method of private appropriation under uh, uh, the neoliberal policy but of course, the capitalist class can adjust no? from neoliberalism to softer methods. But then, uh, before they can do that, there will be in places where, uh, you know, the reactionaries uh, uh, will, will, and fascist, fascism is also, you know, neoliberalism and fascism are now rising together. These are, these are not signals of the permanent defeat of the proletariat, but these are proddings on the proletariat to, uh, to raise higher and uh, their, revol their revolutionary struggle. Okay. okay. Now, um, they say the competition for businesses under capitalism have enabled the development of technology. Would you agree on this? How would, uh, how would there be further development of technology in the socialist realm, or is this guaranteed? I think uh, so a socialist uh, uh, socialist uh, society accepts uh, advances in uh, science and technology faster, um, and uh, the socialist uh, um, uh, dispensation actually allots more resources for research and development. No. Um, uh, uh, I do not deny that good capitalists, no? capitalists that make profits, are open eh? uh, to accept uh, um, higher technology. And I would use this higher technology to extract more surplus value from the working class. I will not mind, you know, adjusting I would not. I would not. I wouldn't uh, have no conscience about using technology to speed up production, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I will not reduce the work hours or raise wages of the workers. Um, I can just kick out some workers uh, that are no longer needed because of the more efficient technology. That's capitalism. Um, but I do not deny capitalism has grown because it has used science and technology. And uh, that is undeniable. Uh, but I think uh, uh, socialism is more open uh, to the development and use of science and technology. And most importantly, socialism um, makes sure 
that the advance of science and technology also advances uh, the, um, um, the living and cultural conditions of the working class. Uh, a socialist society will readily decrease the working hours mm -hmm. so that workers will have more time for cultural uh, activity uh, and raise the wages at the same time. But capitalism will make it a point. Uh, they would uh, capitalism would rather have uh, 2,000, how many? 2,300 billionaires eh? owning up uh, what is equivalent to six to what 60% of humankind owns. No, that's uh, that's capitalism, especially under neoliberalism. So uh, I think I can. Uh, my answer is uh, easily easy easily. Um, uh, is easily understood no? that cap uh, that capitalists that are profitable know how to use science and technology to extract surplus value from the workers. But in the case of socialism, they would use both uh, science and technology and one side and the collective labor of workers in order to, Im to uh, improve uh, the living and working conditions of the workers, reduce the working hours, and um, increase the remuneration. Okay, thank okay, you so thank much. You. We have the last question now, Professor. Uh, did Marx believe that socialism cannot be advanced unless a capitalist state is achieved first? And was there a new theory about achieving socialism without resorting to or going through capitalism? Well, uh, uh, Marx... Uh, face up only to the problem of the rise of uh, industrial capitalism in uh, capitalist countries. In the, uh, um, in the Communist Manifesto, you see Marx only, you know, talking about uh, the bombarding of uh, capitalist manufacturers uh, um, uh, on uh, uh, the backward villages of the world, no? Uh, he did not yet uh, reach, uh, it was not yet the time for Marxism um, to reach right away um, what um, uh, level of study and uh, theorizing that Lenin would do. Uh, you see, uh, it so happened that, um, um, that Russia, uh, as the weakest point of the imperialist uh, uh, system contained not only industrial enclaves but also wide expanses of feudalism and medievalism. And so, um, uh, even before Lenin, Plekhanov had already conceived of uh, uh, stages in the Russian Revolution as being bourgeois democratic first and then, um, and then socialist. Uh, the big difference between Plekhanov and Lenin is that Lenin said that in the bourgeois democratic uh, revolution, the working class can already uh, assume and exercise political power. And um, uh, in the uh, and of course, the socialist revolution would be led by the working class. And in China, um, being a semi-colonial and semi a feudal uh, country, uh, pre-industrial, with the comprador big bourgeoisie and the landlord class uh, dominant. Um, uh, you see there that um, you have a more clearly defined and uh, bourgeois democratic revolution. You can you can call it new democratic, people's democratic revolution. Those those are synonymous terms. Um, they they are. Uh, this is uh, the very distinct stage of, uh, of revolutionary struggle that can be led by the proletariat. Um, uh, and it has to be led by the proletariat so that it can, uh, it can uh, proceed, glide into the socialist stage of the revolution. Uh, but it takes uh, some time, at least some decades, to accomplish the, uh, this bourgeois democratic revolution of the new type. Uh, but uh, because of Lenin's uh, understanding of the two stages of the revolution in the Russian Revolution, it would be easier for Mao to understand uh, these two stages of the revolution. 
and learning from the China's experience in the Philippines, we learn more easily uh, the necessity of the two-stage revolution. There can be no big leap eh, from uh, uh, semi-colonial and semi-feudal conditions to socialism. Only a uh, Trotsky idiot would think of that. No, <laughs> the, the Trotsky idiot would think that if you just if you pass through the new democratic stage revolution, you are surrendering to the bourgeoisie. My goodness, no, he doesn't he doesn't know that. Uh, the bourgeoisie at best can be only a secondary ally, eh? yeah. secondary to the basic alliance of the working class and peasantry. The, the reason why Trotskyites cannot win any revolution is that they have no sense of reality. Out of purism, they will not be able to do anything. Um, so the purely working class struggle, all powers to the workers without consideration to the peasants and the uh, petty bourgeoisie, and to some degree, the national bourgeoisie would put you out of the game. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Professor Jose Maria Sison, and to our viewers and listeners, we thank you for sitting with us this afternoon for this episode on the National Democratic Line Online. The MD Line Online today had a Marxist critique on the political economy just discussed to you by Professor Jose Maria Sison, the Chair Emeritus of the International League of People's Struggles. Now let's have the last word from Professor Maria Sison to say goodbye and thanks. Professor? Yeah. I'm thankful that uh, we have this uh, uh, session and uh, I hope that uh, we have uh, learned uh, from each other uh, through my presentation and our exchange of uh, questions and answers. Uh, so uh, I hope that we can keep this uh, program and the in under and the uh, online online. School continuing so that we will continue to learn for what purpose. Eh? Uh, we have to know to understand we have to light our way eh? to the revolutionary goal of socialism. That's why we keep on trying to uh, understand the situation and understand each other and arrive at the ideas that can guide us uh, in moving forward in the real practice of uh, uh, the revolutionary struggle. Thank you so much. And we end this afternoon's episode. Um, the next Sunday again for another episode of Andy Line Online will be open to you. Thank you and goodbye. Is, is that already a topic? In it.
Let's